Tor, the very best in science fiction and fantasy. Hi, I'm Orson Scott Card. I wrote a book called Ender in Exile. The funny thing about uh, Ender's character is I never meant him to be important in any other story. When I wrote the original short story of Ender's Game, um, Ender was just the kid, the story was done, that was it. It was when I was working on a novel called, at that point, Speaker of Death, became Speaker for the Dead. I was having fits with it until I suddenly thought, what if this character is Ender years later? And so I... Uh, started trying to write it that way, and it was really working except for one tiny problem. Ender's Game, the short story, did not end right. And so I was spending the first 50 pages getting from the last moment of the short story Ender's Game to the first part. Anyway, uh, it, it was just not, uh, not working. And so I went to ABA in Dallas. It was held that year, American Booksellers Association Convention, and uh, um, asked Tom Doherty, who was there, uh, Tom, I need to do a prequel. I need to make a novel version of Ender's Game in order to set up Speaker for the Dead. On a handshake, the deal was done. And uh, that's how Ender's Game was born. It only existed in order to set up Speaker for the Dead. There were no other sequels in mind. Then my agent gives me a call while I'm working on Speaker for the Dead. Uh, Ender's Game has come out. And she said, well, I just sold the Ender trilogy in England. I said, well, that is wonderful. But unfortunately, they usually expect three books when you sell a trilogy, and there are only two. Well, she said, can't you, can't you think of another? And uh, at that point, another completely unrelated book called Philohes that I had been working on, set aside. I thought, well, what if Ender were the main character? That's the way it kept going, uh, was that Ender keeps sticking himself into completely unrelated projects that had nothing to do with him. So it's not as if Ender gave rise to the books. It's like Ender gives me the ticket to uh, get into the book. Um, since then, of course, there have been other books in the Ender universe, but this whole Shadow series, Ender is this iconic figure, but he's barely there. He's there in the first book. Uh, I think he makes a long, ansible conversation at the end of the fourth book. Uh, so it's in his universe, but he's not there. So it's not really the character. It's actually, what do you do with really brilliant children? We live in a society that does not deal well with our most intelligent people. We have terms of abuse that you're allowed to use for them. We can't abuse anybody else. But smart people can be dismissed as geeks and nerds, and yet they're the people that our civilization depends on. Everything we use that makes our civilization so, uh, what can I say, so enjoyable to live in was given to us by a nerd or a geek. And yet we have these offensive terms for them. They're socially uh, treated like pariahs in high school, junior high. It just makes no sense to me. But in our educational system, we essentially abandon them. Everybody in, in the process of No Child Left Behind, which was a noble idea, uh, nevertheless, the children being left behind are the best, the brightest. So I'm positing a future in which these kids do what they always do, and this is really one of the reasons people give themselves excuses for leaving them behind, is uh, we, uh, they, they will rise to whatever level they can achieve, whatever their ambition will let them do, because they really are as smart as they seem to be. And um, when you have these smart kids, they will accomplish things. So what I've been doing, especially in the shadow books, is what does it do to these smart kids to be given adult responsibility at an early age? Um, in a way, I cheat. I make them often more mature, less crazy than the adults who are actually running things. But when you think about it, in, in the real world, the way it functions right now, we turn power over to whoever wants it most. You know, nobody in their right mind would run for president. What a hellish experience that is, that these kids of genius would be uh, valued and uh, treated like an important resource. And once they're put in a position where they can handle the reins of power, they act. But through all of this work, there was this huge hole, which is Ender himself. Uh, so it's not as if Ender gave rise to everything. It's as if finally I'm coming back to him and finishing... Uh, his response to that, to the really terrible and difficult events of the first war. In the original Ender's Game, and it's correct, that's the way it should be, uh, I should not have gone off into everything that I've done in this book, uh, which is good because I hadn't thought of it yet, so uh, we, we, won't, we won't go far into that one yet. Uh, but uh, in writing Ender's Game, I had... Um, I had completed the story that the short story was, and all I needed to do was to have him meet the Hive Queen, and 
set up what we were going to do 3,000 years later in Speaker for the Dead. Uh, so I really glossed over everything. Uh, showed you that he had his troubles, but I made it kind of, it's kind of a dreamy chapter, that last chapter of Ender's Game, where we just slip through time and Ender actually ceases to be a character. I'm just coasting on the character that the readers already know. Well, with Ender in Exile, I start right at the end of chapter 14 of Ender's Game. Uh, and then most of Ender in Exile takes place between chapter 14 and chapter 15. Then I cover all the material of chapter 15 again. And, uh, and then we have the last section of Ender in Exile that takes us a little farther forward. But most of this book takes place on the starship that is traveling between Earth and, uh, and the first colony planet. And this is, in a way, such an unbelievably static book. In another way, it is really getting, getting us through Ender's healing, getting us through how he has to respond to the world around him. He's cut off from home. He can never return to Earth. Uh, essentially, the life that he might have thought he would have someday is over. It's out of reach. Uh, it's like having died, but you're still there. Uh, and so he's making a life for himself. And he's doing it with the pieces that are given him. He's been given this job as being governor of a, of a colony world. At, at, a, at you know He's 13 years old, uh, 14, I think, by the time he gets there. And how does a 14-year-old govern adults? Well, it helps that he's a legendary figure. But even then, he's not the legend. Everybody takes him as the legend. But he isn't the legend. So how do you deal with being famous, uh, being brilliant, being resented, uh, hated by some people? It's a tough assignment for a kid. But in the process of the years that this book covers, he has to grow up. He has to find a place for himself in the adult world. Because the war is over, and that place is gone. The sequence of reading the Ender books is simply impossible to decode. There is no coherent way to read them. You cannot read them in time order because I screw around with, with the, the order of the books so badly. Let me explain how this goes. Um, the very first book is First Meetings. But these story, First Meetings is a collection of short stories that begins before uh, Ender's Game because it's about the meetings of... Uh, the meeting of uh, Ender's parents. But it's really only particularly interesting. I mean, I, I think they're pretty good stories, but it's only interesting in the context that these are the parents of Ender. And so it doesn't make any sense. So you can't, those, that's not where you start. The time order thing doesn't work because in the time order, you'd start with first meetings, then you'd read Ender's game. Right before chapter 15, you'd stop, read all of, almost all of Ender in Exile, then stop, read the last chapter of Ender's game, then go back to Ender in Exile. But in the meantime, you should have been right along reading chapters from Ender, Ender's Shadow, which is completely parallel to Ender's Game. I have three novels that overlap significantly. How in the world do you sort that out? I have no idea. All I know is that uh, it really, the order in which you read it kind of depends on your age. I think basically if you're under 18, don't go straight from Ender's Game to uh, Speaker for the Dead. Instead, read all of the Shadow books and Ender in Exile. Uh, then go to Speaker for the Dead and uh, Xenocide and Children of the Mind. And then you'll have a much more entertaining order. Uh, Xenocide and Children of the Mind, even Speaker for the Dead, they remain difficult books. They are definitely adult novels. Of course, I wrote Ender's Game as an adult novel, too. I did not conceive of it as a YA book. Uh, Ender's Shadow and the Shadow books are also, you know, I make no concessions for young readers, but um, they do have kids as the protagonists, whereas the, the later books don't. So um, they're better for younger readers, and by younger I mean under 18. But once you're about 18, you're probably ready to just sail straight on through and read them in the order that I wrote them. Look, the most important thing about the order in which to read the Ender books is it truly doesn't matter. I write all of these books to stand alone. I give you all the information in each book to allow you to understand all the events in that book. You won't be confused. You won't be lost. It's not as if I get to the end of one and I immediately pick up the next one right where that left off. Uh, every one of these books is designed to be a novel in its own right. And I think with Ender in Exile, um, if you've never read, if you've never heard of Ender's Game, you can still read Ender in Exile. It's the story of a soldier coming home from the war, only he can't come home, so he has to make a new home. 
where he is, where he's sent. And that really, in, in human history, has been often the story for soldiers. Now, modern armies, we have, you know, transportation is not a problem. We can bring people home when, if they live through the war. But uh, in ancient times, you know, the Roman army, those soldiers went out to war with the firm expectation that their reward for 30 years of soldiering was going to be land to live where the land was. And often that meant that they lived where they had served and their kids grew up to serve in the army where they had served. So it became a permanent exile. Wherever you were from, you ended up going out, serving, and that's where you lived. Well, at the end of Ender's Game, that's what happens to an awful lot of soldiers. And in Ender and Exile, the basic situation is that the commander who won the war is now being forbidden to come home. He's just too powerful a figure. No government wants him, or else every government wants him. They all fear him. And so he is put in exile to govern over other people descended from those soldiers in the war that he won. That means that this is a new world to him, it's a new world to the readers, and it doesn't matter whether you've read Ender's Game or not. Uh, and in the meantime, um, the really frustrating thing for me is that I have a lot of other books that have nothing to do with Ender Wiggin. Most of my books are not about space, they're not about science fiction, they're, not, they're just completely different. But I, I'm happy that people read the Ender series. I'm proud of those books. Uh, and so I'm not discouraging people from reading them, but just every now and then, those who are really Ender fans, just realize that the same guy who made up that stuff has made up other books too. I'd, I'd really love to see people try them out. Ender's family gave a lot of the shape to his life, both the support that he got from his sister Valentine. He sort of clung to her as his angel of light and hope. Uh, a kind of a fantasy version of her because nobody could live up to the image of perfection that he had of her during his years of isolation in battle school. His brother Peter became a demon in his mind, and believe me, Peter had worked very hard to achieve that image uh, because of his envy and, and resentment of Ender's success where Peter himself had failed. But Peter's not the monster that Ender thinks he is, and Valentine is not the saint that he thinks she is, and, and uh, Ender comes to realize that in Ender in Exile. But the root of his life is actually his parents. But like most children, he has no clue what they mean in his life. Most parents uh, are treated by their children, regarded by their children as heir, as uh, you know, this home where dinner gets served a lot. You know, the better your parents are, the less you notice them. Um, and so Ender is not aware of all that his parents do. In Ender in Exile, his anger at not being home with his family, his anger at their shyness about contacting him when it became possible to do so after the war, um, is reflected in his actions. He doesn't understand who they are. They really never had a chance to find out who he would become, because he was taken away from home at age six. And so that's a rift, a permanent source of pain to him. But there's a kind of a sort of a reconciliation there. The odd thing is that for readers who read the Shadow books, they get to know Ender's parents far better than Ender ever did. They, they continue to be strong, present parents for Peter, the least likable of the Wigan children. Uh, but the children that left, that went into exile, Ender and his sister Valentine, who voluntarily went with him, um, basically live a life without their parents. Once they leave, um, their parents play less and less of a role. The absence of parents for Ender is one of the most crucial aspects of his personality. He finds substitute parents. And those substitutes do a good job. They, they give him what he needs. All three of the Wigan children are extremely bright. Uh, both Peter and Valentine, uh, Ender's older brother and sister, were top candidates to go to battle school. Oddly enough, they're actually much brighter than many kids who go. But uh, there is a crucial element, aggression. You have to have a lot, but you can't have too much or you can't work with anybody else. You end up being a rival of everybody. You end up having all of your wars be between you and the other soldiers instead of being between you and the enemy. So there's a balance that they have to find. And it was on the issue of aggression, aggressiveness, uh, that Peter and Valentine were rejected. Valentine because she simply wasn't aggressive enough. She didn't actually care that much about winning. And uh, Peter, because he cared way too much and was willing to do anything to, to achieve victory. 
but his victory would be over anyone who got in his way, not over the enemy designated by the military. Ender was aggressive, uh, ambitious, but obedient, cooperative. He saw the bigger picture and let himself be part of it. And that made him really valuable to the, uh, uh, to the military. So it's not that he was the smartest of the Wiccan children. He wasn't even the smartest one in the room uh, during the actual fighting of battles by remote control. Uh, that would be the character Bean, considerably smarter, uh, but not quite human. Uh, but uh, it didn't matter, because what Ender had was the ability to unite people into a common purpose, which is what leadership is about. 